Amen. Every praise. Amen. We got some praises this morning. Amen. Let's pray and praise this morning, would you? God, thank you for this time we have together in your house. Yes, Lord. Thank you for the blessing that it is to come together in one mind and one accord. Lord, let this be like the day of Pentecost when we're all gathered here with the same mind and the same purpose. And that is that we are lifting up our voices in praise in concert prayer to you today. God, we just ask that if we've come in here with needs that need to be met, well, God, we've come to the right place. Amen. Help us to put those things here and not carry them out with us. Yes, Help us to receive what you have for each one of us today in this worship service. Yes, we ask in the name of Jesus our Christ. Amen. 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 You may be seated. We are so delighted to see you in worship today. Uh, if you're new with us, I'm Reverend Keith Mazingo, and I just want to say a special welcome to you. Um, we're glad to see some folks back that haven't been in a while. In fact, I haven't been here the last couple of weeks, and so I'm glad to be back with you in worship today. Um, This morning's scripture reading is from the 25th chapter of Matthew, verses 34 through 40. Then the sovereign will say to those on his right, Enter, you who are blessed by my Creator. Take what's coming to you in this kingdom. It's been ready for you since the world's foundation, and here's why. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was homeless, and you gave me a room. I was shivering, and you gave me clothes. I was sick, and you stopped to visit. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then those sheep are going to say, Sovereign, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and come to you? Then the Sovereign will say, I'm telling the solemn truth. Whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. You know, uh, if you were here the last couple of weeks, I was not with you in worship. I was here part of the week each week, and then I was out for the weekend. week before last, I drove to Tulsa, Oklahoma to officiate the wedding of my niece, uh, Tiffany Braden, and so I got to see some family and friends up there, and then I was uh, traveling back uh, on, on the weekend, so I wasn't able to be in worship with you. And then last week, I flew up to Chicago to be a part of an ordination service for uh, a dear friend, Tijuana Gray, um, who was at MCC Los Angeles when I was out there on staff before I came here to pastor, and uh, who was not in seminary at the time, but um, she said that because of my ministry, and I, that was a real blessing. I, I'm, I know it sounds like I'm just patting myself on the back, and I don't mean for it to, but I say this for a reason. Because of my ministry, she decided to go into ministry. And what I, the reason I wanted to tell you that is not because I want to lift Keith up, but, but to say that we have influence over people when we don't even know it. Amen. Your life influences people when you don't even know it is. Yeah, amen. School teachers get that a lot of times when nobody else does. But yeah. your life, every person in here, your life influences other people without you knowing it. Yeah. And sometimes you never know it. To want to happen to tell me and then invite me to an ordination service. So I got to be there. She also asked me to preach last weekend at this ordination service a sermonette. Okay, so that, that meant like 10 minutes. It's like, okay, I can do it. And then she gave me two scriptures to preach from. And I was like, by the time we finish reading the scriptures, it'll be time for me to sit down. And one of the scriptures was the one that was read, except she read the whole part of it. Today we started with just the sheep. And those of you that grew up in Sunday school or grew up reading your Bibles, you're kind of familiar with that story. And by the way, I chose the other story 
because I don't much like this story. I'll just be honest with you. you Pastor, you don't like things in the Bible? Yeah, there's some stuff I just don't like. I'm going to just go ahead and tell you. I don't much like when we're pitted against each other. And in this story, there are people pitted against each other. Some to the right, that was the sheep. And some to the left, those were the goats. And I don't much like stories like that because, you know, it means some are better than and some that are less than. And Lord knows I've been on the less than end all of my life. And I just get tired of that. Amen. However, if you, and, and I'm going to go ahead and warn you, if you go home and look up the rest of that story, it's awful ending. It does not have a pleasant ending for the goats. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, does not have a, an, a, a comfortable, wonderful ending. But I'm not even going to tell you the ending. You know why? Because if we just concentrate on the ending of that story, we've missed the point of the story. Because the point wasn't about how it ended with separation of God or separation from God. It was really about how do we live while we're here. It was really what are we supposed to be doing? How am I supposed to be living? Well, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, it's easy for us, even those of us who have been on the less than group or considered the goats of the real world out there sometimes, to turn that around. Because there's some people I think are goats too. <laughs> I may be in the minority, but there's some folks that I just think are goats. They're acting like goats. They're stubborn. They're being rude. They're putting people down. I, some of you know this, since the Supreme Court ruled for marriage equality, mm -hmm. did your Facebook blow up? Yeah. <laughs> did you find some sheep and some goats? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, there have been some folks that I put on my goat list. We'll just go on and tell you, I might as well be honest and just say it. I put some folks on my goat list. Of course, I was probably on their goat list too, or they wouldn't have said some of the ugly things they said. Then the other day, a person who has been a real, real supporter of GLT people, in fact, it's a straight woman who has a gay son, and she very much honors him and loves him and blesses him and, you know, lifts him up when um, Bruce Jenner became Caitlyn Jenner. She had something to say about that that was really kind of snarky and ugly. And I was like, who, what? Who is this person? Have I misread you? And then she was walking the line between sheep and goat with me. And then I wondered if she really meant what she said, so I gave her the benefit of the doubt because I needed to rest that night. Because <laughs> see, it was really about my rest. It really wasn't about her at all. And I heard, I heard a Christian person say the other day, there was, he, what was his, his thought? His thought was that, uh, Caitlin, uh, there were men these days thinking that they're women and that the world had more things, more important things to be worried about. And I thought, he hasn't had to walk in those shoes. He hasn't had to live in a body that didn't match. If he had a child that needed corrective surgery, I guarantee you he would do it and not bat an eye and not think there was any spiritual connection, not think there was anything wrong or out of the blue to have corrective surgery. Do you think they would? I don't think they would because I have a feeling he really loves his kids. So what's the difference? If it's not fitting and it needs to be something new, something Thing updated something that matches what we are on the inside. I'm going to just tell you there's been a lot of ugly unleashed. I mentioned uh, the Supreme Court ruling. Um, I wanted to show you this in case you missed it this week. I put it on Facebook, but our church in Augusta, Georgia, this is uh, Church of Our Redeemer MCC in Augusta, Georgia, and it's a historic building that they own, and you can see that it's been defaced. This is not the first time. 
Um, on the day of the ruling, our pastor there, he and his partner, Reverend Rick Sosby, who some of you know because he had a he briefly pastored down in New Orleans, and he and his partner were one of the first couples to get married. And it was, of course, on the news, and, it, and people found out he did similar to what we do. He has wedding packages, and he's out there in the public eye offering to marry same-sex couples. And uh, some of the folks in Augusta are not very happy about that. So they uh, have defaced his building. The good news is his church folks came together and have cleaned all of that off as best they can. And a lot of MCCers from other cities that were able to drive that distance are with them in worship today in Augusta Amen. to say we're standing in solidarity Amen. with you in Augusta, Georgia to say this is not the way you handle things. And I can guarantee you whoever sprayed that on that church felt like they were doing God's business. I can guarantee you they felt like they were doing God's business. They were trying to save souls, you see. But they were going about it in a very unchristian and a very wrong way. It was the goat syndrome had got a hold of them. A lot of ugly has been unleashed. Jesus was pretty clear in this story that he told. He was really clear. He left no room for doubt that that's not the way we're supposed to live. In fact, if you read up above that when he talks to the goats, he says, well, you didn't come and do this, and you didn't come and do that, and you didn't come and... Let, let, let me go back for a second. You didn't feed me when I was hungry. You didn't give me a drink when I was thirsty. You didn't give me a room when I was homeless. You didn't clothe me when I was shivering. You didn't stop and visit me when I was sick. You didn't come see me when I was in jail. And they're like, well, we never saw you in any of those situations. And then he turns around and talks to the sheep and says... I was hungry and you fed me. And I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was homeless and you gave me a room. I was shivering and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you stopped to visit. I was in prison and you came to me. Now here's the good news. The sheep didn't know it either. They said, well, we don't remember ever seeing you in any of those situations either. What are you talking about, Jesus? And Jesus says to them, whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. Amen. You did it to me. Amen. That is the point of this story. That's the point, not the end of the story. The point is, how are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to? We are to do to others. We are to treat other people. That's why Jesus' last word to people was this, that we love God and we love each other as ourselves. I will tell you I was uncomfortable with that reading and I skipped over it for that ordination service. But there was something else that Tijuana Gray had um, shared with me and she actually had shared it on Facebook the week before I went up there and here's what she said she said my neighbor has a gate with a beware of the dog sign on it you've seen these yes, yes. beware of the dog signs on, on people's gates but now pay attention I want you to get a visual of this my neighbor has a gate with a beware of the dog sign on it. No fence, just a gate and a sign and a yard. All right, now think about that for a second. There's a gate out front and where there's supposed to be fence on either side and going down, there's no fence. There's just a gate at the end of the sidewalk. 
that says beware of the dog. And I got to thinking about that and I said, I wrote her back and I said, Tawana, there's a sermon in there. Somewhere there's a sermon in there. Of course, I got the sermon. Here it is. <laughs> With my sermon, not hers. You know, uh, got, uh, dog spelled backwards is God in English. And so I got to thinking, beware of the God. Beware of the God. Now, get that visual. You've got a sign out front that says, beware of the God on the gates. But in a gate, you can go in and out, yes? But there's no fence. There's a yard, but there's no fence to hold God back. In the fence at my house, this house, this one, not the building house, this house, that house, that house, that house, that house, you get it. We are supposed to let the God loose. Quit leashing God up and holding God back. We've got a whole world that's beyond. And I, I was thinking as I visualized, I could see it just as clearly as Tijuana had written just those few lines. I saw the gate out by the street, you know, out by the sidewalk and no gate, I mean no uh, fence up. And, and any dog that was running out could run right out past the gates and just roam the whole community. And if they were up to it, could roam the whole town. And if they had the strength and somebody fed it or it found food, could just keep going. Could just go right on. Because if it's unleashed, most dogs will go wander around and explore and find new friends. Yes? And it's the same with God. If we allow God in our lives to be unleashed, if we let go and try to keep having, you know there are a lot of denominations that try to keep God in. Amen. I grew up in one. I mean we couldn't date anybody. I was Church of God and you couldn't date anybody that wasn't Church of God. And there was nobody except Church of God people that were going to heaven when they died. The Baptists down the street were not going. The Methodists down the street were not going. And the Catholics, well, that was a cult. We didn't know what they were. <laughs> Just telling you what they were told us as we were growing up. I'm not lying to you. That's what they taught us. Because we were the only ones going. We had God leashed up in our denomination, and we worshipped our denomination. We had a theme song, The Church of God is Right, Hallelujah to the Lamb. And we sang it over and over and over, you know. Some people wonder why we sing the praise and worship songs and you sing them over and over and over. It's like a mantra. It's supposed to get in your spirit so that it becomes less about words on a page but something in your spirit. It becomes the praise of your heart. It becomes the praise of your spirit and then when you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning that song comes back. It comes back. It wasn't until I found Metropolitan Community Church that I found out that God could be unleashed. Amen. God could be unleashed. Because let me tell you something about the church of God that I grew up in. When they found out who I really was, they showed me the gate. <laughs> Forget the fence. They showed me the gate. The exit gate. Some of you have experienced that. And I'm not saying that they're all like that anymore because a lot of churches are coming around. They're trying to get there. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter what name is over the door. What matters is, are we unleashing God to our community, to our city, to our country, to our globe? Because Jesus told us how to live. He told us how to do it. He told us how to do it. When you've done it to this one, you've done it to me. When you've done it to this one, 
You've done it to me, Jesus said. This is how you live. Unleash the God that's in you. Unleash the God that's there. You say, well, pastor, does that mean I'm supposed to feed every single hungry person? I don't have enough money to make that happen. Well, maybe it's time to get creative. Because there are some things I can do as an individual and be a blessing to other people. But then there are also times I can come together like we are today. We have a food cart in there in the other room. I can't keep it full of groceries by myself, but when we come together as a church, we have a cart full every month that we can share with the hungry. And that means, first of all, the people that come into this building that are hungry, whether church members or not church members, if they come into this building and they're hungry, they can go take stuff out of the cart all during the month. If it's there and you need it, you take it. I don't mean if you want it and you can go buy your own groceries. That ain't what I'm talking about. But no questions asked. If you need it, that's what it's there for. Amen. Amen. And what's left gets taken over to Hope Ministries. What? Aren't they Methodist? Why, yes, they are. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you taking it over to the Methodists? Because we and lots of other churches, lots of other denominations, and lots of other groups besides churches take food over there and put it in their Hope Ministries grocery store and the people that come in can come in and shop for groceries. And it feeds the hungry every single day. When you've done it to these, you've done it to Jesus. You've done it to God. That's the point. Our own Mike Smith, who is not here today, came to me the other day and said, I need your advice. I'm like, ooh, he doesn't often ask me for advice. He gives me advice a lot. He's my administrative assistant. But he's also my network leader, so he's under me and over me at the same time. And he had a network question, because I used to be the network leader, so he asked me, well, I, I want to make a donation with network money for a chair or two for uh, Hattiesburg, Joshua, yeah. Joshua Generation MCC, because we're doing this chair project. He said, I'd like to put a little network money to that. And I just wondered what your thought was on that. And I knew how much money he was talking about, so it wasn't going to buy many chairs. It really wasn't. He wasn't talking about a lot of money, but he wanted to do his part. He wanted the network to take some responsibility. I said, let me ask you this. How about, lest you and I go down, and you can take that $30 that you were going to spend on the chair, and we're going to go see such and such a pastor that's also in our network, and take her to lunch. And we're going to show her what we just did as a project. And we're going to show her our connection. And she's going to see how excited we are to be a part of Joshua Generation. And then we're going to ask her if she'll go back and let this be a project at her church. Uh-oh. You mean you're going to spend that $30 that you could have bought a chair on for somebody's lunch? Uh-huh. You know why? Because it's going to create not one or two chairs. It's going to create another 50 chairs. Amen. Hello? Yeah. There's more than one way for us to do it. If we can't do it all individually, we can put systems in place that look out for multiples. Amen. I've told you the story. I, I, I can't remember all the details. I should have looked it up, but I, I, I remember enough of it. Do you remember uh, the story of Mother Teresa being on a plane going somewhere and they were going to bring them lunch on the plane? This was before you had to buy everything on the plane, obviously. But they brought her lunch and she said, how much did that lunch cost? And, of course, they bought him a bunch. And they were like, it was probably $5 for the lunch. And she said, could you save my lunch to give to someone else? And they said, well... Sure, and, and, and other people around her heard what she was doing and saying, they said, well, 
I'd be willing to donate mine too to someone less fortunate. And before it was over, the whole plane, nobody ate on that plane ride that day. They all gave their food away. Of course, she had the pilot, she asked to speak to the pilot, and had the pilot call ahead, and they had trucks waiting for the lunches to come off the plane to go somewhere else. And then she had another place in mind that they could actually take the lunches. And after a while, the, the airline said, well, we don't want to just take that many. We'll donate that many more. So they put more in there. And it snowballed. And after a while, there were a lot of people that ate that day that would not have eaten at all because one woman said, I'm willing to donate my lunch today to do, make sure that somebody else that's hungry gets fed. My sisters and brothers, we have the opportunity. We all have it in us. We all have God in us. We all have the Spirit of God in us. And I hope that when we leave every week from this place, people, <laughs> when we go through our neighborhoods, people say, beware of the God. <laughs> they got a sign on the gate. It may not be written in letters on them, but it's because of the works that we do individually and collectively. We can get together and create it to creatively unleash God in this community, in our community, it's not just about GLBTQ people, even though there's a lot that still has yet to be done with GLBT people. But GLBT people also have God and spirit in us, and we can go unleash that. We can unleash that. We can show them how sheep are supposed to be living how we're supposed to be giving and accepting. You know, you don't have to agree with everything. I don't agree with everything. I was talking, I, I performed a wedding last night, and one of the guests came over and was talking to me about MCC. Well, I didn't know anything about MCC, and, of course, I explained it to him. And he said, well, now, you know, I, we're wrestling with that. I'm Methodist. And I said, yes, you are. Y'all are, are wrestling with who people are. Are you going to let us in or not? Are you going to keep us in? Are you going to let us be equal? Are you going to keep us over there in the goat pasture? Or are you going to let us wander around with you sheep? Amen. Come on now. Amen. And he was so receptive. He was so eager to hear everything I had to say. Why? Because I wasn't preaching to him. I wasn't being ugly or rude to him. I accepted him as having a different thought. Mm -hmm. But I also had to say, this is his experience. This is what he's heard. This is what he's grown up with. And look at where I came from. And if you can come from where I came from and now unleash the God, hello. He can do it too. And those people that you've unfriended on Facebook can do it too. Because you know, the same God that stopped the old Saul on the road to Damascus and changed, he had to pure change his name. He got so changed and so different. He went from being a murderer of God's people to being a conversion person for God's people. Amen. He became a minister for God's people. He had to change his name. Otherwise, he probably wouldn't have gotten very far. He went from being Saul to being the apostle Paul. And I think that the end of that was probably there as a reminder of where he had come from, but not where he is now. And we are not where we used to be. None of us are where we used to be. And I'm so thankful that God keeps changing us, keeps doing work on the inside of each of us so that we can go unleash it on a world. I want to tell you today, there may be a gate but there ain't no fence. There's no fence. There's no fence. There's plenty of yard. There's plenty of community and neighborhood. And there's plenty of city. And right on and right on. And we can do it. Jesus told us how. Jesus told us how to do it. To just live. And I, just like I said a while ago, I pray that as we go from this place today, that wherever we've been, 
we can get a damage report because they will say, beware of the God when you see that one coming. Amen? Amen. Amen. I am Todd. I grew up in southern Arkansas. The first time I came to an MCC was after I had begun college, so I was 18 or 19. And the first time I walked into the doors of an MCC, it all just melted away. I suddenly saw a positive image of uh, homosexuals. I saw a message that not only could I continue to be a Christian, I could continue to be uh, whatever I wanted to be in this world. Um, MCC has continued to give me a strength and a positive view of people and of life and uh, helps convince me that I have to hang my head in shame to know. I am Todd and I am MCC. We thank you for all of the many ways that you bless us in giving. We have ways of giving with our finances, but as, as the sermon was just now, there are many ways that we gift. We have little blue cards that you may have seen also, and I think there's some maybe even in the offering plates where you can fill out, it looks like a little check, that you can fill out things that you've done for community service, that you've blessed people during the week. And it's not because we want to just pat you personally on the back for doing that, but it's so that at the end of the year we want to see just how many hours our church people have collectively gone out and unleashed the God in our communities and been a blessing. Uh, we want to say thank you too for these lovely flowers that were given today for uh, Daryl uh, Taylor. See, there are many ways to give. Amen. We appreciate that. Would you pray with me? God, as we take this offering, we ask that you will bless it and let it go farther than we ever dreamed or imagined. Thank you for the gift and the giver. Thank you for those who have to give today Thank you for those who don't have to give today that they will be blessed and blessed and blessed so that they will have something to give the next time, that they'll be able to give as they totally want to give with a cheerful heart, not begrudgingly, but because we want to move forward and we want to move this place forward in this community. In the name of Jesus our Christ. My sisters and brothers, it comes time for us to come to the table of God, a place where the elements, the bread, the juice, are freely given to all of us, just as the life of Jesus, not just on the cross, but on the 33 years that he lived, his life was given to us and for us. On the night that he was to be betrayed, he took bread from the table and blessed it and broke it and said, this is the bread of life that is broken for all of you. Then he took the cup and he blessed it. He said, this is the cup of forgiveness. It is here to forgive you of all of those things. As you take this, know that your sins are forgiven. From this day forward, know that those things that you shouldn't have done are now covered. Those things that you should have done but didn't are now covered. You have today, you have another opportunity. My sisters and brothers at Metropolitan Community Church here and around the world, we serve an open communion. And I mean a truly open communion. That means that everybody here is welcome at God's table. What we do is simply take the bread, dip it in the non-fermented grape juice, place it on your tongue, or if you so choose, cup your hands, we will place it in your hands and you may serve yourself. Also know that there will be a prayer partner stationed on either side that is there to pray with you if you have a special need, a special request. Just know that you are welcome today at this table. With the, uh, all we do ask is that you come as the ushers direct. Would the acolytes and servers please come forward? Would you pray with me? God, thank you for this time we've had to be in your house. Thank you for this faith community that's willing to not only do individual work, but put systems in place and be creative in our 
ways and our functions so that whatever we have, we are able to give unbegrudgingly, unselfishly, so that we can be a blessing. We can feed those that are hungry. We can give drink to those that are thirsty. We can visit those that are sick. And all of those other things that you listed, God, because you said when we do it to these, we have done it to you. And we just ask you, God, that we'll go out of this place today realizing that the fence is gone. So the world needs to beware of the God in us. We ask these things in the name of Jesus our Christ and all things that are holy. Amen. Amen. Shake hands and be friendly.